As an attorney, I was spending countless hours and money on legal research, but now there's a better way. Using Lexis or Westlaw can cost your firm upwards of $500 a month, and frankly, they've become outdated. Case Text is a new platform that uses three unique tools to help you do your best research. Case Text Research works just like any other standard legal research engine, but also uniquely offers artificial intelligence technology to help you search easier, find better results, and it can even help you write the first draft of your brief. It's so easy. With new search technology called Parallel Search, you can type in a sentence or question and Case Text will immediately find on-point legal precedent. It's a concept-based search, so even if you don't type in exactly the right words, it'll still find the right result. With Kara AI, you can just drag and drop any document, like a complaint or a brief, and it will immediately go to work finding relevant research. And with Compose, you can even get the first draft of a brief or motion written, including case law specific to your jurisdiction in just a few clicks. The answer is simple. Save money and time with case text. Case closed. Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Constitution Day. Our US Constitution was ratified 234 years ago today, and the discussion you're about to hear is a great way to mark the occasion. I'm Belinda McCauley, Executive Director of the Beverly Hills Bar Association. Thank you very much to our sponsor, Case Text, for allowing us to bring today's webinar to a wider audience. And thank you very much to our co-hosts today, the John M. Langston Bar Association of Los Angeles, the Southern California Chinese Lawyers Association, the Mexican American Bar Association of LA, and the Asian Pacific American Bar Association of LA. You will receive your CLE certificate by email shortly after this program. Please take a moment to complete the survey that's included. Now, I know who you're all here to hear, so I am not going to take your time running through their very extensive bios that I suspect you know already anyway, but suffice it to say, we're very fortunate to have our panel today. Erwin Chemerinsky and Melissa Murray are two of the country's leading constitutional law experts who will walk us through what to expect with the upcoming Supreme Court term. And they'll be guided by our moderator, Kimberly Atkinstor, a fantastic journalist and brilliant lawyer herself. So Kimberly, over to you. Thank you so much, Belinda. And I do too want to jump right into this conversation about the U.S. Supreme Court and the term ahead. Before we get to the cases that are on the merit docket, though, I want to talk about a little bit more of a, a broader overview about the court and what's been happening. It's been in the headlines a lot lately about uh, things like the justices themselves speaking about the reputation of the court, for example, and they're coming back to in-person arguments for the first time in 18 months. So I wanna start with you, Melissa, just give us an overview as to what you're thinking heading into this term. So I think this is going to be a barn burner of a term for the court. Uh, last term was a little bit lighter in terms of the court's docket. They didn't accept as many cases. Many speculated that this was likely because of the expectation of continued action on the shadow docket dealing with coronavirus restrictions, and that certainly proved to be the case. But many also speculated that the court went a little bit lighter in anticipation of some sort of existential Bush v. Gore type controversy that might emerge in the residue of the 2020 election. That obviously didn't come to pass, but we definitely saw the shadow of the 2020 election and certainly claims of electoral fraud in the way the court resolved later cases on its docket, including a major challenge to two Arizona voting restrictions. So it wasn't a heavy term per se, but it was a very consequential one. And one that I think we might see as table setting for what will surely be a really impactful term going forward with a lot of major landmark cases that will shift the landscape of the court's jurisprudence. And Irwin, you know, that usually the summer is quite sleepy for the U.S. Supreme Court, but this summer hasn't been. They have been uh, a very, very busy on that so-called shadow docket, these orders that come down often unsigned. Uh, sometimes you don't know how people voted except for when blistering dissents are attached to them. Usually these are sort of run-of-the-mill matters, but this time they were really diving into religious rights and um, abortion rights. Talk a little bit more about that. The shadow docket is in matters come to the Supreme Court on an emergency basis. The matters come to the court for an injunction 
or to stay an injunction that a lower court issued. Scholars such as Stephen Vladek have documented that in recent years, there's been a substantial increase in activity on the so-called shadow docket and very important rulings have come through it. So there have been several rulings by the Supreme Court concerning governor's orders that were imposed to stop the spread of COVID. The first couple of these were five to four in favor of the governors and ruling against the religious institutions that wanted exceptions from the closure orders. Then after Justice Ginsburg was replaced by Justice Barrett, there were a couple of important cases, one the day before Thanksgiving, one the beginning of April, where the justices five to four ruled in favor of the religious challenges and against the governors. It was a very tangible indication of the importance of replacing Ginsburg with Barrett. And of course, on September 1st, there was the Supreme Court five to four refusing to issue an injunction of a Texas law that's blatantly unconstitutional, prohibiting abortion after the sixth week of pregnancy when Rose said that abortions can't be prohibited before viability. We can talk about why the increase in the shadow docket. We can talk about whether it's good or bad, but the reality is it's a court that's doing much more and more important things through the shadow docket. Yeah, I wanna give Melissa a chance to talk about that and also about perceptions of the court. And in, in recent weeks, we've had three justices make appearances, uh, Justice Clarence Thomas, Justice Amy Coney Barrett, and Justice uh, Stephen Breyer, who's out with a book, talking about perceptions of the court. I was really struck, uh, particularly with what Justices Thomas and Barrett said about the idea that the court should not be politicized and it should be separate given how political, uh, including Barrett's own uh, installation onto the court was. So the fact that we have one third of the court weighing in to defend the court's legitimacy and to make clear to the public that the court is nonpartisan is by itself a shocking development. And I, and I don't think it's coincidental, it's certainly in light of what happened on September 1st with that ruling on Texas SB8, which allowed that Texas law to go into effect, essentially hobbling abortion access in one of the most populous states in the union. What I do think is interesting, though, um, is that it is also coincident with the Quinnipiac poll, which puts the court's popularity or legitimacy rating at its lowest point in the entire time of the history of such polling. So they began doing this poll in which Quinnipiac asked individuals in the public about the court. And this is the lowest ranking that the court has ever had since that began in 2004. And then, of course, there are the continued cries for structural reform. But I will say that if these three are the people that the court is putting out before the public to disclaim claims of partisanship, they probably need to get a better message. I think it takes a lot of cheek, and I'm paraphrasing Justice Scalia here, for Amy Coney Barrett to say that the court is nonpartisan while she is giving remarks at a center name for Mitch McConnell and while she is flanked by Mitch McConnell while she's giving those remarks. And likewise, Justice Thomas noted that the court simply does the law, but in his own writings for the court, he has noted that stare decisis and that deference to past precedent need not hold in circumstances where a judge determines that the past precedent is, as he puts it, demonstrably erroneous, um, necessarily a judgment call in, in some respect. So all of that, I think um, the optics of those kinds of statements are really poor given the nature of the message and how it's being conveyed. I very Go much ahead, agree. Erwin. Yeah, I want to agree with Melissa on this. Um, Amy Coney Barrett last weekend said the justices, quote, are not partisan hacks. I have an op-ed coming out in the LA Times this Sunday where I say, if the justices don't want to be perceived as partisan hacks, they shouldn't act like partisan hacks. If you look what the Supreme Court has done in the last decade with regard to elections, the campaign finance case, Citizens United, striking down key provisions of the Voting Rights Act in Shelby County, not allowing the federal judiciary to stop partisan gerrymandering, the voting rights case from July 1st that gutted section two that Melissa was talking about, all of them were exactly along partisan lines and all dramatically helped Republicans who are running for office. And when you look at what the Supreme Court has done, it is completely in accord with the Republican platform. And so I think the criticism is completely appropriate and I think the defense, as Melissa was saying, is very hollow. 
So we have a, a very busy docket coming up and I wanna jump into that one point that I forgot to make in the beginning to members of our audience. If you have a question for the panel, please submit it in the Q&A function. Uh, don't put it in the chat, I won't be able to see it then, but if you put it in the Q&A function uh, at the end of the program, I will get to as many as time permits. So I wanna start talking about uh, the religion case on the docket, uh, Carson V. Macon and Erwin, can you tell us about that case? Sure. As Melissa has talked about in other contexts, perhaps the greatest immediate change on the Supreme Court has been with regard to religion. That overall, if you look at it, it's a court that is not enforcing the Establishment Clause, but is very robust in protecting free exercise of religion. With regard to Carson versus Macon, for several decades, the issue before the Supreme Court was when may the government choose to give aid to religious schools? When does such assistance violate establishment clause of the First Amendment? Now the issue is, when is the failure to give aid to religious schools a violation of free exercise of religion? So we've shifted in a relatively short time from the question of when may the government do something to now when must the government do something? In 2017, in Trinity Lutheran versus Comer, the Supreme Court said that Missouri violated free exercise of religion in not giving aid for playgrounds to religious schools when it would give the aid to public or secular schools. In 2020, in Espinosa versus Montana Department of Revenue, the Supreme Court said that Montana violated the Constitution when the Montana, Montana Supreme Court invalidated a Montana law that allowed aid to private secular schools, but not religious schools. The Supreme Court in those cases said, whenever the government gives aid to private secular schools, it must give that aid to religious schools unless this would meet strict scrutiny, be necessary to achieve a compelling purpose. As Justice Sotomayor said in her dissent in Trinity Lutheran, this was the first time in history that the Supreme Court ever said the government was required to give aid to religious schools. Well, Carson versus Macon comes out of Maine. There's a good deal of the state of Maine that's so rural, they don't have public schools. They have school administrative units and the school administrative units give money to the parents that the money can be used for private secular schools. It can't be used for quote, sectarian schools. This is a challenge to that. And if that's what I was saying, where the claim is that the government is infringing the exercise of religion by not allowing the assistance to be used at religious schools. Now, Maine says this is different than the Missouri or the Montana cases, because these are places where there aren't public schools as an option, so it should be able to do this. And yet, if the Supreme Court follows the recent pattern, what you're gonna see is the court enforcing an obligation of the government to subsidize religious education. Melissa, what are you looking out for in this case? So I, again, I, I agree with everything that Erwin said about this case. This is a really important one. And I, I think what happens this, in this case and what I think is likely to happen in this case really gives you a sense of one of the stock moves of the Roberts court in how it shifts the Overton window in, in some of these cases and how it actually shifts the jurisprudence. So as Erwin said, this whole question of funding to, to non-sectarian or, or religious units um, has been coming up for a number of years. It first reared its head in Trinity Lutheran, the court there was at great pains to disclaim the idea that this was a far reaching decision. They talked about this just being about playground resurfacing. And, and then we had Espinosa, which pushed it a little bit further, pushed the envelope a little bit further. And now this case, I think, is really the case that's poised to sort of topple the entire house of cards. I mean, so I, I think once you have a decision in this case that decides in favor of the religious institutions, then it's a pretty inexorable slide to school vouchers and a lot of other things that have been deemed more constitutionally questionable by the court over time. But that's exactly what this court has historically done on some of these hot button issues like union and labor organizing, for example. It's this incremental step-by-step, case-by-case push that over time yields this ultimate outcome. 
So I want to move on to another area that's been a little less step-by-step step and, and moving a lot more quickly lately, it seems, and that's reproductive freedom. Uh, there is the Dobb case that is on the docket already. And of course, there is the uh, also the SB8 challenge in Texas that is making its way there. I want to start with you, Melissa, and take us through uh, Dobbs and what, what happens next. So the last abortion challenge to come before the court was in October term 2019 with June Medical Services versus Russo, which is a challenge to a Louisiana admittings privileges law that was virtually identical to the Texas admitting privileges law that was struck down just a few years earlier in Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstedt. Um, the fact that the court took up June Medical Services was by itself interesting, given that it had decided the question just a few years earlier. Um, but in that case, which was decided by a five to four majority of the court, we saw saw the Chief Justice join the liberal wing to strike down the statute, but he was very clear. Um, he had not changed his position on reproductive rights, but he was a fan of stare decisis, and stare decisis required the vo his vote in that case, as he said. But he wrote a separate opinion in which he emphasized Planned Parenthood versus Casey's substantial obstacle test rather than Hellerstedt's balancing test, which is more rigorous um, and, and required more of the states to show. That was the last case. Much has changed since that case was decided. Um, and the biggest change has been in the personnel of the court. So as we know, in September 2020, just a few months after June Medical Services was decided, Justice Ginsburg passed away and she was replaced by now Justice Amy Coney Barrett. And I think what we see at the state level in terms of increasingly restrictive abortion regulations is a response to that changing personnel on the court. Um, the states recognize that they were likely to find a more hospitable rep re reception for these abortion statutes among this new six to three conservative supermajority. And Texas's SB8, the Texas law that's been challenged, is certainly reflective of that, but so too is Mississippi HB 1510, which is the law at issue here in Dobbs. And so Mississippi has prohibited abortion at 15 weeks of pregnancy. This is patently unconstitutional given the court's extant jurisprudence on abortion, Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which prohibit the state from restricting abortion before viability, which is the point at pregnancy at which the fetus can survive outside of the womb. And that's typically around 23 or 24 weeks. Um, the abortion providers here immediately filed suit. The law was enjoined at the district court level and the Fifth Circuit upheld it, noting that it was unconstitutional under those precedents. And so the fact that the court decided to take up that challenge, and it did after having the case listed for conference a number of times, suggests that there was a lot of debate, but ultimately the conservative wing of the court prevailed and got it on the merits docket. Um, so. This case um, really reflects the change landscape, not just in the court's personnel, but also in the way Mississippi is making its arguments. So the arguments that it made in its cert petition, which was filed when Justice Ginsburg on the court, asked the court to take a more moderate measure to simply uphold HB 1510 and deter, and they didn't have to do anything else with its abortion jurisprudence, so just uphold this law. Once Justice Barrett was on the court, Mississippi took a much more aggressive posture and requested in its first brief to the court that the court not only rule that a 15 week ban was constitutional, but to go even further and explicitly overrule Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. So a much more aggressive posture, one that surely reflects the change composition of the court and the justices. So Erwin, there are a couple outcomes from this and that certainly will have an impact on the Texas case with the six week ban. The court of course could uh, rule that this, uh, the Mississippi law is constitutional somehow, that it is not an undue burden. And then they would still have to consider whether a six week ban meets that test as well, or they can overturn Roe uh, on this case and that renders that challenge in Texas moot. What, what do you think will happen? Republican presidents for decades have used a litmus test in picking Supreme Court justices. They selected individuals who would vote to overrule Roe versus Wade. President Donald Trump said explicitly on several occasions that he wanted to pick justice to overrule Roe. We know that Justices Thomas and Alito have already said they want to overrule Roe. And I have little doubt that Justices Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett, the Trump appointees, will vote to do so. I think the only question is, how will they do it? One possibility is simply saying explicitly, Roe was wrongly decided, abortion should be left to the political process, and therefore Roe versus Wade is overruled. 
Another way could be they effectively overrule Roe, but without the sentence saying Roe is overruled. They might go back to an opinion that Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote in 1989 in Webster versus Reproductive Health Services, where he said, we'll just use rational basis review in evaluating restrictions on abortion. And the government has a compelling interest in protecting fetal life in the moment of conception. He didn't say, and we overrule Roe, but that would be the practical effect. But I can't count to five justices on the current court who will vote to reaffirm Roe. And I think an interesting question will be, if it's five to three to overrule Roe, where will John Roberts come down? Melissa, I I think a lot about the practical impact of this. Of course, if the Supreme Court overturns Roe, uh, which seems a high likelihood, it does not make uh, abortion illegal everywhere. It doesn't even make abortion fully inaccessible in places like Mississippi and Texas. It makes it inaccessible for those who don't have access and privilege in order to still receive it. Talk a little bit about the, the real life impact and what might be next? Is legislation the only way to reverse the impact? No, it's a terrific question. And we're already seeing what a world without Roe looks like on the ground in Texas. And and as you say, Kimberly, uh, the brunt of that impact is really being borne by women of color, rural women, um, women who don't have the means to either travel outside of the state or um, to leave the country as some can in order to seek abortion care. So there's a real crisis on the ground in terms of what it means to leave this to the states to regulate, which again, conservatives say is the ultimate output of overruling roads simply returns to the state. But it means that there will be swaths of the country that will be reproductive challenge zones for those seeking abortion care. The other the other concrete impact I think we should really grapple with is that Even if the court does not strike down Roe in Dobbs and instead just upholds the 15 week ban on on, on some kind of logic, what has happened is we've shifted the Overton window in terms of what seems like a reasonable abortion restriction. And again, juxtaposed against Texas, 15 weeks looks quite moderate compared to six weeks, but it is significantly different from what we could expect when Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey were being observed as the law of the land. All right, and we still have so much more uh, to go through. It's, a, it's quite a packed docket. We've already talked about uh, religious rights in, in terms of the First Amendment, but now there are also free speech cases on board. Erwin, tell us about those. Sure, there are a couple of speech cases on the docket at this point. One is City of Austin, Texas versus Reagan National Advertisers. And it involves a ordinance that says that there can be digitized ads on somebody's premises, but there can't be digitized ads for off-campus, off-premises businesses. So if Berkeley Law School wanted a digitized ad, we could put it on our building, but under this ordinance, we couldn't put it anyplace else. Well, Does that violate the First Amendment? And people might wonder, why is this an important case? Well, several years ago in Reed versus Town of Gilbert, the Supreme Court struck down an Arizona ordinance. And what it involved was that there could be signs for political activities on public property that could be large in there for a long period of time, but there couldn't be signs for other things like religious worship unless they were very small and for a limited period of time. And the Supreme Court said, that's a content-based restriction on speech. It has to meet strict scrutiny. It has to be necessary to achieve a compelling interest. And that threw into dispute zoning ordinances that exist local governments all over the country. Well, this is the chance for the Supreme Court to clarify, did it really mean what it said in that case? And it does so here in the context of the kind of ads that might matter in the 21st century, digitized ads. The other case that's interesting on free speech is Houston Commission versus Wilson. It involves a member of a city commission who was outspoken, maybe even obstreperous. And his fellow commissioners censured him for his speech. There weren't tangible consequences, but he said, it violated my First Amendment rights to punish me via censure for the speech. Well, some of what's unusual is just the context, members of a commission sanctioning one another, 
But there's also the question of what's a sufficient burden on speech to trigger First Amendment analysis? That, of course, can come up in so many different contexts. And so, Melissa, I know last term we had a case that probably grabbed more headlines than either of these will because it involved a cheerleader and some uh, choice words that she dropped on Snapchat. But what does this, what do these cases, what does that case and what might these cases on the docket tell us about the way this court sees free speech? Yeah, it's a terrific question. And um Mahanoy versus BL, which I've termed the salty cheerleader case, really did occupy a lot of press time because the facts were so fantastic. And it was also a very important ruling in that the court had not in 50 years credited student speech in the way that it did, although the opinion certainly leaves open a lot of questions. Um, and one thing that was actually quite interesting about one of the separate writings there was a separate writing from Justice Alito in which he really talked about this whole idea of cancel culture. And he has mentioned cancel culture before in some of his speeches, notably his speech before the Federalist Society's um, national gathering last year. And I think the Houston case is one where we may see some of the more conservative justices having an opportunity to really stretch their muscles and talking about their objections, if they have them, about this whole idea of cancel culture and being able to censure individuals for the nature of their speech. So I want to get to another big case. We have the Second Amendment has returned uh, to the docket of the U.S. Supreme Court uh, with the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association case. Melissa, tell us about that. Well, it was inevitable that we were going to come back to guns at the Supreme Court. It just what was the vehicle? A couple of years ago, the court took up another case that was also brought by this gun rights group, the New York's um, New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus New York City. But because the law at issue in that case was later repealed by New York, the case was mooted and the court didn't really have an opportunity to engage in the substantive debate over the nature of the challenge. Um, but now, almost 10 years after Heller, which was the case that recognized a right to own a gun for purposes of self-defense in the home, the court has another opportunity to really think about and perhaps even elaborate the scope and substance of the Second Amendment. So this case, NYSERPA versus Bruin, involves New York City's ban, um, or excuse me, New York City's concealed carry restriction. So New York City allows individuals to have a concealed carry permit, but only if certain restrictions or protocols are met. And so in this particular case, the petitioners who are represented by NYSERPA have argued that their application for a concealed carry permit were, was denied and the denial violates their Second Amendment rights. Um, the most notable part about this is really just how much this was seeded in some of the discussion of the earlier case, NYSERPA versus City of New York. Um, there, Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Alito both expressed serious concerns in their own separate writings in that case that lower courts may not be properly applying the Supreme Court's most recent gun rights rulings, um, Heller and McDonald versus City of Chicago. And Justice Kavanaugh there urged the court to address that issue soon, and, and he noted Noted specifically that there were a number of Second Amendment petitions that were pending on the docket. Um, there were also about 10 other Second Amendment petitions pending on the docket in May of 2020, and the court in one fell swoop decided to reject all of them, prompting a very vigorous dissent from Justice Thomas, who argued that the court seemed to treat the Second Amendment um, in a much more cursory fashion than it treated other fundamental rights claims, and he noted specifically the court's treatment of speech cases and abortion cases. Um, Justice Thomas seems to have gotten what he wanted, though, in this term, because the court is going to take up a big Second Amendment case, um, one that has a narrow question, but that narrow question could lead to a major landmark ruling on the Second Amendment. Erwin, talk about that question. I mean, this idea we know from Heller that there is an individual right uh, to carry a gun according to the U to own a gun according to the U.S. Supreme Court, this case essentially would, uh, it's asking whether that right extends beyond the home um, with, these, with these carry laws. Talk about what the impact of this ruling could be. From 1791, when the Second Amendment was ratified, until District of Columbia versus Heller in 2008, not one federal, state, or local gun regulation was struck down. District of Columbia versus Heller said, there's a Second Amendment right to have guns in the home for the sake of security. But that's a narrow holding. It's just about guns in the home. It was just about 
handguns, and the court didn't articulate a level of scrutiny to be used. I think it's interesting that 13 years have gone by, and now the Supreme Court is getting back to the Second Amendment. I think this too relates to the death of Justice Ginsburg almost exactly a year ago today. I think the conservative justice on the court who really want to expand gun rights were unsure that they'd have John Roberts as a fifth vote. And it's only after Justice Ginsburg left and was replaced by Justice Barrett that I think that the conservatives think they've got at least five votes to strike down most gun regulations. And I think this is going to be a broad rather than a narrow ruling about the right of people to have guns outside the home, including a right to con carry concealed weapons. And Melissa, talk a little bit. One question that I get uh, when I talk about cases like the Second Amendment, Amendment cases or others on there is, well, in the future, is this cyclical? If we have this expansive view about the Second Amendment rights, might that be sort of narrowed if the court changes again in the future? Uh, likewise with Roe, if Roe is overturned, is it gone forever? How does this work? It's not exactly like the legislature where they can switch what what laws are in place based on who's in power. It's a lot long, longer lasting, right? You know, the Supreme Court is most definitely an institution with a longer time horizon than either of the political branches. And, and obviously that's a question of constitutional design, but I think we're also seeing the ramifications of it today. Uh, the justices are being appointed at younger and younger ages. Um, that is also true for judges on the lower federal court. And I will note that the Trump administration was incredibly um, proactive and successful in stocking the lower federal courts with their nominees and also very successful at the Supreme Court of three uh, vacancies that they were able to fill with justices who were roughly 50 or just over the age of 50. Um, Justice Barrett is below the age of 50 and she'll be on the court for a long time. So these things may be cyclical, but at the court, we are going to be living with the consequences of these appointments for a very long time. Uh, Erwin, do you have, did you have something more to add before I move to the next topic? Well, I was gonna echo what Melissa said. Amy Coney Barrett was 48 years old when she was sworn in on October 26th. If she stays on the court until she's 87, the age was just as Ginsburg died, Barrett will be a justice into the year 2059. When she was sworn in, Neil Gorsuch was 53, Brett Kavanaugh was 55, John Roberts was 65, Samuel Lita was 70, Clarence Thomas was 72. The best predictor of a long lifespan has been confirmed for a seat on the Supreme Court. Justice John Paul Stevens didn't retire until he was 90. So it's easy to imagine five or six of these just being together another decade or two. Yeah, that's a good point. And after Stevens did retire, uh, he later expressed regret and said he thought he did it a little too soon. Uh, I want to move on to our uh, civil rights cases. Um, Erwin, tell us about Thompson v. Clark. I always try to identify what might be the sleeper cases on the docket, the ones that aren't going to make headlines, but going to be a huge effect in terms of how law is practiced in people's lives. Thompson versus Clark could be that. Larry Thompson and his wife had a week old baby. His wife's sister was with them and she suffered from mental illness. She called 911 and said that she thought that the week old baby was being sexually abused because there were red marks on the baby's buttocks. EMTs came and Larry Thompson answered the door and said, I don't know why you're here. And I said, oh, it must be a mistake in terms of the address. Later that night, they came back with several police officers. Thompson said, you're not coming in unless you have a warrant. The police officers pushed down the door, pushed Thompson down. Thompson apparently shoved one of the officers. They took the baby to the emergency room. Nothing ill had been done to the baby. The baby was suffering from diaper rash. The prosecutors prosecuted Thompson for resisting arrest, obstructing the police officers. The prosecutors, I think wisely, chose to dismiss all the charges against Thompson. Thompson then brought a civil suit for malicious prosecution. In Heck versus Humphrey, the Supreme Court held that there can't be a civil suit, such a malicious prosecution, that would be inconsistent with a conviction 
until the conviction is overturned, such as on appeal or by habeas corpus. Well, there was no conviction here. Heck versus Humphrey would seem completely inapplicable. But the district court said, though this makes no sense, there's second circuit precedent that says somebody cannot sue for malicious prosecution until there is an affirmative indication of actual innocence. Well, in this instance, the prosecutor just dismissed the charges and the federal district court said, therefore, there can't be a civil suit. There's no affirmative indication of actual innocence. And the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit dismissed the charges. If the Supreme Court affirms the Second Circuit, it is gonna make it so hard for anyone to sue for malicious prosecution anytime the charges are dismissed. In fact, they give prosecutors a tremendous incentive to indict people and then dismiss the charges, knowing that that will provide them blanket protection for malicious prosecution. We don't have a mechanism in our legal system for someone when charged and dismissed to get a declaration that they're actually innocent. Now, my hope is that the Supreme Court will reverse the Second Circuit because its approach makes no sense, but this could be a really important case if the Supreme Court doesn't do that. Well, Melissa, what do you think the chances are that the Supreme Court does what or when uh, hopes that they do? I mean, I'm not great at prognosticating about what the court will do. Um, this is a court, I think, that is often very much solicitous to the state's position and the police officer's position here. It's also a court that I think over the years has narrowed the avenues for redress that civil rights plaintiffs can claim. Um, but back to your question about the impact of this kind of ruling, you know, I don't know the race of Larry Thompson and his family, but I do know that those families that typically are the ones that are likely to be embroiled in the child welfare system, and this was at bottom a child welfare case to some degree, are likely to be black and brown families and poor families. And so uh, they will bear the brunt of decisions like this. And as Erwin says, there will certainly be strong incentives if this decision upholds um, the Second Circuit's ruling. Um, there'll be strong incentives for prosecutors to file these indictments and then to just dismiss them, but without actually establishing that the plaintiff was correct or innocent underlying the ultimate um, charge going forward. Okay, so I have a couple more questions before I get to some of the questions submitted from our audience. Uh, one is about a case that is not yet on the docket, but it seems to be heading there and is certainly consequential. That is the Harvard affirmative action case. Melissa, tell us about that case and, and where it stands. So this is a case that's been pending on the cert petition list for a long time. Um, as a matter of background, it's been about five years since a divided court. Uh, it dealt with the whole question of affirmative action, and it dealt with it during that interregnum period between when Justice Scalia passed away in February of 2016 and later in 2016 when Neil Gorsuch was later, or 2017 when Neil Gorsuch was appointed to the bench. But in that period, when they had eight justices, they managed to eke out a four to three decision with Justice Kennedy writing for the majority to a poll the University of Texas's use of race. Um, and Justice Kennedy was joined there by Justices Breyer, Ginsburg, and Sotomayor. Justice Kagan was recused because during her time in the Solicitor General's office, she had actually worked on that case. Now, this new case comes before the court, and it's brought by a group called Students for Fair Admissions, which is a nonprofit that was formed by Edward Bloom, who spearheaded the underlying Fisher suit uh, against Texas. It came to the Supreme Court in February um, from the First Circuit. Uh, both the District Court and the First Circuit upheld Harvard's race conscious admissions policies. The students here argue that Harvard violates federal law by considering race in its admissions processes. And then secondarily, they've also asked the court to reconsider and to overrule Grutter versus Bollinger, which is the 2003 Michigan affirmative action case that the court decided upholding the use of race conscious admissions in higher education. Um, this is a very different court. I feel like we keep saying that, but it bears repeating. This is a very different court than the one that heard both Grutter and Fisher. Uh, this is a six to three conservative supermajority. Um, Justice Thomas has been very clear about his own reservations and indeed antipathy for affirmative action and so have other members of the court. So I think the real question here is, will this ever make it to the docket? Um, back in June, the court asked the Biden administration Solicitor General's office to provide its views of the case and 
I think everyone knew what the Biden administration's views would be. So that seemed to be a stalling tactic to studiously avoid getting this case on the docket for this term. But it certainly could come up in this term. But the Biden administration has not provided its views. They have, I believe, until November to do so. So it might be a while before we see any action on this case. But while this case is pending, there is also another case pending dealing with the University of North Carolina. And while this case, the Harvard case, presents a statutory challenge that also invites the court to rethink Grutter, that case presents a constitutional challenge because it involves a state university. And that may be the more attractive vehicle for the court if it wants to take up affirmative action again. Erwin, I want to get your views on this case and also on uh, what this case makes me think of as a reporter who covered the court for many years when the court was hearing the the, the uh, cases like the uh, Michigan, the last Michigan case, the shooty case. Um, that was one of the areas where everyone in the court leaned forward whenever Justice Kennedy spoke at oral argument, because we knew at the end of the day, it could very likely be up to him. Uh, with the change of this court, how does that change really the, the complexion of these cases as they make their way to the high court? Melissa's right. The change in the composition of the court alters everything. In Fisher, as Melissa said, with Justices Kennedy and Ginsburg in the majority, there were four justices. There's no doubt Kagan would have been with them had she was been participating. But Justice Ginsburg in a speech later said, Justice Kagan would have been with us. But two of those five replaced, and I don't think there's any doubt that the justice who replaced them, Kavanaugh and Barrett will come out the other way. Also, sometimes we now think of John Roberts as being more of a swing justice of course, there are five justices more conservative than him, but not on affirmative action. His vote isn't in doubt. The opinion that he wrote and parents involved with new schools for Seattle's number one in 2007, or the opinion, concurring opinion he wrote in Schutte, make no, leave no doubt whatsoever that he will be a vote to overrule Gruda versus Bollinger, Regents University of California versus Bakke, Fisher versus University of Texas, Austin. I think the only question in my mind is, will they use the Harvard case as a vehicle for doing so? As Melissa pointed out, Harvard is a suit against a private university, obviously. So it's not a constitutional claim. It's brought under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act that applies to recipients of federal funds. In Bakke, and then again in a companion case to Grutter, Gratz versus Bollinger, the Supreme Court said, the standards under Title VI are identical to the standards under equal protection. So the court could take the Harvard case, decide it is Title VI, but make clear the same would apply with regard to the Constitution, or the court could wait for the North Carolina case and then just deal with it directly under equal protection. But I, don't, I can't count to five votes to reaffirm Fisher, Grutter, Bakke in light of the change in the composition of the Supreme Court. I want to ask one more quick question overall as we're going into this new term before I get to some of the really good questions that the audience is asking is one conversation I had in my household today was about transparency. I mean, we talked at the top about some of the speeches that have been given by Justice Thomas and, and Justice Barrett. Um, we have uh, for 18 months had a court that was mostly closed off, but it had at least uh, a live stream audio of their arguments. But it's very rare that there's often a, an opportunity to understand why the justices do what they do or why they think what they think outside of the rulings that they that they uh, hand down. And they're not making it easy, any easier with some of these speeches where press access even is very, very limited. What do you think about that? I understand that they're not politicians, but they are the top part of the of a very important branch of government. And there doesn't seem to be much transparency there. Erwin, what are your thoughts? I want to talk about two things. One is that the court isn't nearly as transparent as it should be as an institution. And what I mean by that is when there's votes on cert petitions, which are so crucial, we don't know who's voting to grant or deny. Why is that? Or often when matters are in the shadow docket, these are rulings. We often don't know who's voting which way unless there's dissents and we can then add up the votes. There is this presidential commission on the Supreme Court, and I would hope it will make recommendations to increase transparency 
of what the justices are doing. And I give many more examples of that. The other thing I wanted to say is, I think it is laughable for justice to say, as Justice Barrett has, as Justice Breyer has implied, that the justices' views have nothing to do with how they decide cases. Throughout American history, the justices' views have been crucial in how cases are decided. Marbury versus Madison wouldn't come out the way it did, but for John Marshall's views with regard to federalism. The Republicans worked so hard to block Merrick Garland and rush through Amy Coney Barrett precisely because they know the views of the justices matter so much. The Constitution is written in open-ended language. Balancing is inherent in constitutional law. All of that means that the justices' ideology matters. And I think the justices are not helping their own esteem by saying something that's so ridiculous as, I'm just following the law, my views don't matter. It's not coincidence that the decisions of the Roberts Court so track that of the Republican platform. It's not because the framers of the Constitution and the Republican platform saw the same way. It's that the justices are following their ideology, as justices always do. You know, a related question comes from a member of our audience uh, about potential ethics reforms as this commission considers uh, reforming the Supreme Court. It says, should common ethics prohi prohibitions, such as bans on speaking fees and conflicts of interest, apply to the court? Is the self-policing, is self-policing really sufficient? Melissa, what do you think? Well, I, I think it is unusual that the justices do get to be self-regulating this regard in a way that other jurists do not, um, and, and we know that. Um, I think there's a case just this term involving British Petroleum, and there was a call for Justice Barrett to recuse herself from that case because I believe her father um, had been an employee of either British Petroleum or a division of British Petroleum for some years. And Again, if the question is one of the court's legitimacy or a sense of the court is being studiously neutral, I think compliance with the sort of standard ethics procedures and protocols that other professions would employ, including judging more generally outside of the Supreme Court would be really important in, in sort of putting to rest some of the views that members of the public have that the justices just aren't playing fair in terms of disclosing their ties to particular groups and, um, and, and or even to particular companies with which um, family members or other loved ones might have affiliation. So I, I think just as a question of the court's legitimacy, it would make sense to reassess that. Erwin, what are your thoughts? I agree with Melissa, take this example of recusal. This is the only instance I know where judges are allowed to decide for themselves whether to recuse. In most federal district courts and courts of appeals, others have to make that decision. And this just follows a basic principle. No one should be a judge of himself or herself. And in fact, in the instance Melissa mentions, Justice Barrett didn't even explain why she didn't grant the recusal petition. I think when there's a recusal petition, there should at least have to be an explanation for why it's not being granted. Yeah, I would agree with that as well. Uh, we have a question about the recent uh, Department of Justice action with respect to Texas's abortion law. It says the DOJ is challenging the Texas abortion ban. What is the precedent for that action? Erwin, what is the legal basis behind Attorney General Merrick Garland's move? The Texas law is unconstitutional. Until Roe versus Wade is overruled, state can't prohibit abortion at what seems to be about six weeks of pregnancy. Now, what makes the Texas law unusual is it doesn't have the state play a role in enforcement. It's enforced through civil suits. And Texas then says, you can't sue us for an injunction or a declaratory judgment, can't sue our officers for that because we don't play a role in enforcement. Well, if ever there were a civil suit brought against a doctor or a reproductive health care facility, under the Texas law, they as a defense could argue it's unconstitutional. The Supreme Court has said repeatedly that when there's a civil suit, damages, liability can't violate the constitution. All the lawyers remember Shelley versus Kramer from 1948 that said that a court can't enforce racially discriminatory provisions in a contract. Or New York Times versus Sullivan from 1964 that said a court can't give damages for defamation in a civil case in a way that would violate the First Amendment. What makes this unusual, to go to your question, is that the Justice Department is coming in and trying to have the Texas law declared unconstitutional. 
And they're invoking Shelley versus Kramer, but that doesn't answer the question, what's the authority of the Justice Department? In part, they're trying to use the FACE Act, the Freedom of Access to Clinics entrances, but that seems a stretch because that's really about physically obstructing access to clinics. The other ground would simply be that the Justice Department has the authority to come in to enforce the Constitution when civil rights are being violated. I think it's a fascinating theory. It's a well done complaint, but I don't think it's a slam dunk that the United States can come in in these circumstances. Yeah, Melissa, what do you think? So I agree with everything that Erwin said about um, not just the idiosyncrasies of the DOJ's petition and the legal theory that it rests on, but I, I will just note that it is a novel and perhaps unorthodox move to check what has been a novel and unorthodox move to halt abortion access in the state of Texas. And you know, the DOJ is very clear in its petition, the reason why it has taken this unusual step of trying to sue Texas and with it, Texas's state officials and the private parties to whom enforcement of the law has been delegated is because Texas has undertaken what is essentially um, a, a kind of fiendishly cynical play to avoid judicial review of the statute, which would surely have blocked, would surely have enjoined the law and blocked the law from going into effect. So the fact that the federal government needs to get involved here is purely because Texas has so, has so stymied everyone by creating this novel and frankly, just deeply cynical enforcement scheme that takes the state out of the process of enforcement entirely and delegates it to private individuals for the purpose of ensuring that it cannot be challenged in federal court. So we have another question from our, from our audience. Do you expect any of the cases challenging the COVID vaccine requirements to reach the court next term. It seemed, uh, well, that those cases made up the brunt of the shadow docket for a while. And it seemed perhaps that over time, as these limits were lifted, they might not make it, but now more are being imposed. Melissa, do you think that we might see the court really take up, particularly on this religious, uh, on this religious rights uh, expansion that they seem to have done on the shadow docket? Uh, certainly. I mean, I don't even know if it necessarily has to be a question of uh, religious exercise. I mean, the recent, um, uh, Biden administration ruling or um, executive order that allows OSHA to actually deal with this by creating uh, vaccine mandates for workplaces through the OSHA statute may be a place where the court can also exercise its antipathy for the administrative state, um, not simply its, um, its interest in expanding religious liberty. So I think there are a lot of different avenues that this might come up before the court. That to me seems to be the most promising one. I, I'm sure it is likely to be challenged. Um, and then again, the whole question of whether the OSHA statute allows for something like that is I think a question that may receive a more skeptical view from this particular court. Well, Erwin, talk a little bit more about that. I mean, we know that OSHA uh, is statu has the statutory authority to require, you know, goggles in factories and hard hats on construction sites. How, why would the requirement that a worker in, in a certain environment, a, a workplace of more than 100 people, be vaccinated pose a different statutory or even constitutional question? I don't think it does because... COVID can injure workers, make them ill, and that can interfere with the operation of the workplace. I do want to draw a distinction between the earlier cases on the shadow docket, which were religious challenges to governor's orders imposing closure or limits on gathering to stop the spread of COVID versus vaccination. There's really only been one matter that's come to the Supreme Court so far on vaccination. It was a challenge by Indiana University students to a mandatory vaccination requirement. And the lower courts ruled against the students for the university. The United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, opinion by Judge Frank Easterbrook, explained why the government can require a vaccination. And it went to Justice Amy Coney Barrett as the circuit justice for the Seventh Circuit. And she denied relief and didn't even forward it on to the rest of the court. Now, I don't think we're likely to see a religious challenge to vaccination requirements because most of the vaccination requirements have a religious exception. Now, I don't believe they need to have a religious exception, either in terms of the constitution or employment discrimination law, but they do. 
So I think what instead we're likely to see is challenges as you're talking about to can OSHA require this for workers? Uh, can there be other requirements that are imposed, not in terms of religion, but in terms of administrative power or maybe individual freedom? And the only thing I'd say here is quite sadly, perceptions about COVID and vaccination are ideologically divided in our country. And I hope that when it comes to the Supreme Court, we don't see that kind of ideological division. All right, I'm gonna see if I can get two more questions in in, the, in a couple of minutes, uh, lightning round here. One is several justices testified under oath during their confirmation hearings that Roe v. Wade was the precedent they would respect. If they do not, and that was never their intent, are there grounds for removal, Melissa? No. Yes, impeachment is one of the hardest things uh, that we've seen in practice to actually do, and that would be the only means by which to remove a Supreme Court justice. Um, another audience question, do you expect any voting rights cases next term, Erwin? I think so. I think that in light of Brnovich, there's still gonna be doubt about what's left of section two. There's gonna be challenges to the laws that have been adopted, like the ones from Georgia, Florida, Arkansas, Texas. And I think the only question is, how quickly can those get to the Supreme Court? My guess is they'll proceed quickly, probably not quickly enough to get there this term, but Brnovich leaves a lot of questions open as to whether those laws that clearly are discriminatory will be upheld or struck down. And I think some of those cases are gonna to get to the Supreme Court, not this year, next year. And just a quick follow-up, Melissa, the, the voting rights bill that's being negotiated in Congress, if that is passed, how might that change that landscape? Um, so that could be an important move forward, but I think there's already been talk that either of the voting rights bills on both the For the People Act and the John Lewis bill don't quite go far enough to dealing with some of the things that we've seen on the grounds. I mean, this is sort of the difficulty of legislation, especially in a polarized Congress. Um, these laws are written, they're proposed, they're debated, they go through the whole political cycle, but things on the ground are actually moving more quickly in terms of how voter suppression morphs and evolves and actually becomes more pernicious and targeted. And so some of these things um, will be effective, the things that are in the bill, but not everything will be addressed and there will certainly be more to come. All right, well, that is all the time that we have. I am so grateful to both of you for getting through so much uh, in the hour that we had. It was a lot to cover and you did a great job. Thank you so much, Melissa and Erwin. Thank you. Thank you for being such a wonderful moderator. Great. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to talk to you all.